Welcome to another edition of our preseason preview series. Mike, we're looking at the SEC today. We're almost done. We've gotten through every conference but the SEC and Sunbelt. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the questions that we have is sort of where we're getting some news bits coming in. I mean, camps have started up already. And so uh, a lot of the questions that you and I were talking about in the spring and well into the start of summer are starting to play out in some of these preseason camps. We're going to get into that. So uh, anything significant you want to start with while we're kind of touching on the SEC or you want to kind of just wait till we get into the teams? Well, we can get into the teams, but this it's I like talking about the SEC just in the sense that, you know, because so, football is so important down there, you've got two, three, four, five different sites covering these teams as opposed to, you know, Sunbelt, who we'll get into in another day. But we get we have so many sources of information that it, it makes it interesting following these teams. Yeah, back. I mean, the SEC down here is like NFL, and they they seem like they have fifteen beat reporters for every team. And so, uh, you know, the bigger the conference, the more news you're going to get, uh, which is the reason why we're doing the SEC before the Sun Belt. Uh, you know, most Power Five, you know, a lot of leagues that are just Power Five and not full FBS are going to include the SEC, obviously, and we want to get this one up sooner then later. So Mike, let's just jump right into it, man. As we always do, we're going to go in reverse order of last year's standings, or at least try to adhere to that as close as, uh, as much as possible. So let's start with Vanderbilt. What, what are we looking for the Commodores as they open up preseason camp here on the new season? Yeah. I want to know how many carries Ramon Davis is going to get this season. Uh, it's kind of, they were one of my tougher projections, uh, you know, this, this off season, just in the sense that you have, an, a new offensive coordinator that's coming from, in, if looking back, he was with Iowa and he spent time with Cliff Kingsbury, both at Texas Tech and Arizona State. So you have just vastly different ends of the spectrum of his, uh, his coaching experience. So what do we kind of expect that offense to look like? I would tend to think in year one, they're going to look more towards a, a, like a, a pro style, uh, you know, one back formation. Um, and we had the news earlier, uh, you know, last week or, or a couple of weeks ago that Javion Marlowe, the running back two, um, is out of the picture now. He's transferring out. So I think they have a redshirt freshman and a true freshman now backing up Ramon Davis. Yeah. Um, so are they going to lean on on Davis for to carry the workload this year? I'm curious to see how how that kind of shakes out this. this yeah, I, you know, I, I, same question for me as well. If I'm going to take one a little bit farther is maybe just the development of Ken Seals and how he. He develops in the new system. You know, Vanderbilt returns some of their top wideouts, so you would think the passing game would be a strength for them, uh, which is good news for Ramon Davis. Obviously, he can kind of come in, uh, be a complimentary piece to that passing game, and we know with Keon Henry Brooks moving over to Louisiana Tech, the backfield's probably his, especially with, you know, with Marlowe, like you said, being out there. But for me, I think Vanderbilt, it's all about improvement on offense and, and, and how well they improve may depend on the development of seals at quarterback. And he's got some receivers to throw to. And so those are the two bits we'll be looking for uh, for Vanderbilt this preseason. Uh, let's hop over to South Carolina, Mike. What about the Gamecocks? What are we looking for? What are we watching in preseason camp there? Uh, other than just seeing if there's a quarterback on the roster who can hit a target 20 yards downfield, man. Yeah, I made a joke about this during the offseason. South Carolina fans are asking if they're going to run the triple option this year. That's how uh, little confidence they have in the passing game this year. Um, South Carolina, another team kind of like Vanderbilt with just a struggle to kind of formulate projections. I had no idea what the depth chart look, was going to look like, uh, you know, a few months ago outside of Kevin Harris at running back one. Um, but I'm, I'm obviously focused on the backfield. They have three talented running backs um, in, in Lloyd and White and, and Kevin Harris, obviously. So um, how are they going to divvy up those carries? It sounds like Kevin Harris is going to be available week one. We confirmed yeah. it. So um, I don't think we have to worry about that at all. But, um, you know, Lloyd's obviously a five-star talent. Um, White, Zaquandre White, was a, a big, um, you know, he was a riser in the spring. And um, he's continued that from the early portions of camp. So um, just how they divvy up those carries. I think we've seen in the best ball uh, drafts that we've done that, you know, our, our, you know, our group is tentative on drafting Kevin Harris this year. And just because of how much depth they have in the backfield there. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, you know, I'll, I'll go to here, Mike, and I'll just sort of second and echo what you say about the backfield. 
I do have a take about Harris. For me, it's hard for a guy that had such a productive year last year as he did to take a big back seat, even given the depth that they have on the roster. Lloyd is coming back from injury, so you wonder how much they press him. White had a very productive spring, so you figure he's going to get touches. But you know as well as I how important depth is, because let's just go back to last year where we thought Lloyd was going to be the running back one, you know, step in as a true freshman. And look what they had behind him, Kevin Harris, who had a breakout year for the Gamecock. So it does help that they have it. But, you know, the same question here is the same question we have like at programs over at Colorado, right, where, where you know, Jared Broussard had a breakout year. We're here and where they're, maybe they're trying to get more backs and involved more touches and we're wondering you know if that really is going to play out or not same thing applies here at South Carolina but for me just like we were talking about Vanderbilt where there seem to be they seem to have more established in the passing game with seals and the receivers they're plugging in the running backs and maybe that's the lack of depth there no lack of depth at South Carolina but the questions are in the passing game, right? You got Amarine Brown that came over from Georgia Tech. So they did add uh, somewhat of a playmaker at receiver. But Mike, you know, what is it really going to matter if, if the quarterbacks can't get them the ball? And so I think more than anything, we know what South Carolina has. And look, even in the spring, you know, the coaches were saying they still aren't sure what type of offense they're going to run. Is it going to be up-tempo? Is it going to be more traditional? Are, are they going to run a spread attack? Is it going to be run heavy? They were going to try to fit their personnel. Uh, they were going to try to come up with a scheme that was best for their personnel. And my guess is, is they probably still don't have that figured out yet. I'm a little scared for South Carolina right now. And I think that's the reason why many people are sort of staying away from Kevin Harris right now. It's not only the depth, but you've also got an issue where we don't even know if they have a quarterback that could be efficient moving the team down the field. And you wonder how effective he's going to be as a runner. Yeah. You compared South Carolina to Colorado in a sense. And I agree with you. Um, the one difference there is you also have a quarterback at South Carolina. That's probably going to run it 10 plus times a game. I mean, if you look back at uh, Marcus Hatterfield, their offensive coordinator, we got multiple instances of his quarterback one rushing a hundred plus times. And Doty's a, you know, I kind of compare him to a, a Taysom Hill type. Um, he's a really good athlete. So he's going to factor into that ground game as well. What about over at Arkansas, Mike, where uh, we know that they're going to throw the ball around over there, have one of the best fantasy receivers in, in Traylon, Bur uh, Traylon Burks over there. Um, what are the questions for the, for the Razorbacks going into the 2021 season for you? That, that big performance that KJ Jefferson had um, late last year against Missouri. I want to know if that's, a sign of things to come or is that a kind of a mirage and and was that just a one-off performance um I think he's gonna have a good year um you know and it, it, he's he's going relatively cheap I think he's I don't know in the 30 to 40 range in terms of ADP amongst quarterbacks um and that's really good for a QB like Jefferson under uh, Kendall Bryles, that's going to throw it 30 times a game. That's going to run it 10 times a game. There's not many quarterbacks in college football that are going to give you that type of volume. So um, limited sample size, obviously. Um, I was reading up a little bit today. He's about 12 pounds overweight right now. I think there's a, you know, a trending picture on Twitter uh, from, a, from a, one of his preseason media appearances that, um, you know, he's looking kind of chunky there. Um, so he needs to lose some weight. Um, but you know, he's got the arm, he's got the legs and, uh, you know, in this system, quarterbacks tend to thrive. So I'm curious to see how he, he, he shakes out this year. Well, maybe he's eating a lot of bacon, Mike, he does play for the Razorbacks. So, um, but question for me would be a little bit more at running back, right? Are we going to see Trelon Smith with a heavy dose or, or how much are we going to see of Raheem Sanders? I think for me, that bears watching in spring camp. Um, you know, and for me, I think we know what we're going to get with Burks. I think you just stated the value and fantasy value ADP of, of what's going on with Jefferson right now and the potential in that offense. And for me, I'd like to know, uh, you know, is, is Smith going to be, get a heavy workload? We're going to see more of a split. How will Sanders figure into that? Or maybe some other backs that, that maybe we just haven't mentioned yet, but I, I kind of want to see how the running backs shake out because I feel like I know who's going to be the go-to wide receiver there. Yeah, we talked about it all offseason, both uh, Bryles and the head coach, they mentioned they want that 200 pound bruiser back there in the backfield. That's Sanders, and it's not Trelon Smith. Now, you know, maybe we have just a kind of a, a, a transitional period where it's Smith the starter and, and Sanders just they bring him along slowly. But 
I kind of see that one trending towards towards Sanders eventually taking over at some point. What about Mississippi State, Mike? This was a big one. A lot of ears will be tuned into this part of the segment here. Um, Mississippi State, question for you for the Bulldogs going into the new season. Is it obvious as quarterback? So far in, in camp, it is. It's a, it's a bad time for those Jack Abraham truthers out there. You know, they're few and far in between, Eric Proton. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's been Will Rogers as QB1 through the first two, three days of camp. Um, I was reading Jack Abraham was around for the first por portion of Friday practice, but then the beat writers did not see him Saturday or Sunday. So not really sure what's going on there. Um, the South Alabama transfer Chance Lovertich was actually running the uh, second team there. Um, I think it's still smart to uh, handicap or ha handcuff uh, Rogers with a backup, but I mean, I, with the Abraham news, I'm not sure who exactly that is at this point. And right now, it's just it's kind of looking like Will Rogers is going to be the guy. Um, and you did a deep, uh, you know, somewhat deep dive for our, our preseason guide of how the quarterback. The quarterback performance in year two under Leach takes a, a, a substantial leap in jump, that second yeah. year, too. So if Will Rogers is going to be the guy for the entirety of the season, you're getting him at a really good deal right now. Yeah, it's hard for me to think that we're going to see any regression out of that Mississippi State offense compared to last year. And so for that reason, uh, we know that they're going to spread it around. We, we are pretty set with Jaden Wally being the top receiver there. But my question is going to be, you know, who's the two, who's the three, maybe even who's the four, right? I think those guys, depending on what type of league you play, the format, how deep your league is, there could be as many as two to four options in that Mississippi State passing attack at receiver. And the only person we're really sold on right now is Jaden Wiley, who, who should be good uh, in, in preseason camp. Yeah, right. Real quick, uh, just so far in camp, it looks like Makai Pope, the California transfer, he's really stepping up as one of those outside options. I know there was a highlight reel, he had a touchdown um, that they posted on the Mississippi State Twitter feed. And then I, I believe Malik Heath, um, you know, famous for uh, kicking a uh, Tulsa player at the end of that bowl game last year. Um, he's running with the starters and then Austin Williams is still in the slot there. So those seem to be the top four guys as it is right now. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the rankings. I want to say maybe, or, or thinking back to our projections, I know that we had Malik Heath obviously in there. Uh, that was sort of the discussion was, you know, the bowl game and the, and the post game incident, was that going to have any carryover effect? I, I don't, th it doesn't seem like it's going to, if, if, if it does, it's going to be hush hush. Right. Yeah. And we won't hear about it, and we'll start him, and then five minutes later, oh, oh he's suspended. Ah, that's exactly no, no, right. Mike, let's stay in the state of Mississippi and go over to the Rebels at Ole Miss, uh, the Land Sharks, the, the Lane Kiffins, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, the Lebbies. Um, what are we looking for from that offense in 2021? Where, where are your questions lie? Is, is it as obvious as mine, and, and are we looking at receiver here? We on the same it page with that one? Yeah, it's receiver. Uh, we were talking pre-show how, um, you know, news is coming out about John Rice Plumley um, starting in the slots. And, and from all accounts, he's looking really good there. Um, Lane Kiffin said today that he is strictly a receiver now. He's not um, divvying up any, any reps in practice at quarterback. So um, I'm not sure where Ja'Core Pearson is at this point. Um, I haven't heard any mention of him. And he was supposed to be the you know, primary, primary slot guy that, you know, if you're talking back in spring, we projected him to be that guy. I don't hear any mention of him. So um, it's John Rice Plumley right now in the slot. He obviously looked really good in the bowl game last year after limited reps. He had five catches against Indiana. Yeah. Um, and then just outside, it's, it, it's looking like right now, it's going to be potentially a committee of Mingo, Braylon Sanders, and Ontario Drummond. We obviously project Braylon Sanders pretty highly this year. You know, I could see that changing at some point. Well, let, let, you know, let's, let, let's, let's call it. Let, it is what it is right now, Mike. And here's one thing I'll caution everyone to do with all of their preseason pre homework research or anything that we've kind of produced and published up until this point. You can't let one, two, three, five days of news really kind of throw things off for you right now. You don't know what's going on. Like you said with Jakir Pearson, he came over from Western Kentucky, right? What's going on with him? 
Um, you know, there's going to be some incidences around the country where we're going to get maybe some no shows through the first couple of days of practice. We don't know if guys are kind of sitting out because of COVID or contract contact tracing. So I do offer a little bit of a, of a caution against overreacting too soon. And Mike, just like you and I were talking about before the show, I think we're going to have to see a good solid week of some of these spring camps open up before we really start moving the pieces around because you just wonder if there's some things going on, some off-season incidents that might have affect the first week or so of practice. So, uh, but definitely stuff that we're we're kind of keeping our, our finger on the pulse and 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 things that we're definitely keeping our eye on. And I'm just like you, uh, it's down there. It, you know, when you've got a quarterback back like Matt Corral, and you know he's going to sling it around in that offense, there's going to be potentially three good fantasy options at receiver right there. And so that's what we're going to be watching over the next couple of weeks. We'll be watching it closely and. We'll be adjusting our rankings and preseason content accordingly as we get information coming in. Mike, let's go next door from Mississippi, go over to the state of LSU, uh, where we're pretty steadfast in our belief as Kayshawn Booty as a top five preseason fantasy receiver. Uh, we obviously had the news of Mile Brennan with a broken left arm that's going to keep him out for a while, seemingly opening the door and maybe shutting it for Max Johnson. Uh, is that the case? And what are your questions for the Tigers going into the new season? Yeah, same question with Ole Miss, kind of who's who, – well, we know who the wide receiver one, uh, one is here too, but who's going to be that two, three, and four? Because, you know, if if they're going to that Joe Brady offense, like like all indications point to at this point, there's going to be multiple receivers um, that have an impact in college fantasy this year. So – Mainstay right now seems to be J.R.A. Jenkins. Um, he's he's been a consistent starter um, in practices through the spring and, and summer. Um, outside of that, I'm not totally sure. Coy Moore, John Trey Kirkland, yeah. kind of battling for that slot role, um, and then the freshmen. They're, they're, I wouldn't be surprised if one or or, or two um, eventually start here um, with Deion Smith and Chris Hilton. They're they're very talented players. Your mention of freshmen brings me to my question, and that is I feel at least we have the top receivers identified for LSU. What's the pecking order? We're really not sure after Booty, but we do feel quite confident in Booty. What I cannot, what I do not feel comfortable with right now is with an absolute certainty be able to tell you the pecking order of how that backfield is going to shake out. And when you mentioned freshmen, I wonder if maybe they one of the freshmen assert themselves in preseason camp here going into the new season. I'd like to see what goes on at running back between Terry and Davis Price, John Emery, maybe one of those new guys that come in like Kiner. Uh, I'm curious to see how the running back position is going to unfold because uh, last year we had a really good sample size and I don't think we really got much to distinguish uh, between uh, Davis Price and Emery. And so maybe this is an opportunity where, where one of those guys have a, have a uh, you know, sneak in under the radar in camp. And I don't think you can really say that because given how well they recruit, I don't think anyone's going to sneak in under the radar there. But a lot of the attention going into preseason camp is on the veterans. And I'm wondering if some of the freshmen make waves in camp and we'll get an opportunity when we see them open up the year. Yeah, I would, I, I think we would agree that, LSU is one of those teams where I think it's likely that a freshman, whether it's running back or receiver, is going to have an impact this year. Yep. Mike, let's go over to Auburn now. Um, you know, where, you know, obviously they were turning Bo Nix at quarterback, Tank Bigsby at running back. Questions abound at receiver, or at least we, we think they do. Um, I know for me, the development of Bo Nix in the new system, I, I'm relying, I think we both are, on, on that offense to really lean heavily on Tank Bigsby. I think they're really going to try to establish the run um, to maybe even say that more than what they did last year is, is kind of a, a nice thought for fantasy owners with the prospect of, of owning Tank Bigsby. Uh, but for me, the questions are at receiver. Uh, you and I have Elijah Canyon as the, the wide receiver one there at tie, uh, for Auburn, but uh, there's still a lot to play out amongst the receivers over there. That's where my questions and where my focus is going to be for Auburn in preseason camp. How about yourself? Yeah, it's Elijah Canyon. I think among the top 40 receivers in my rankings, Canyon is probably the guy that I have the most unrest about. Um, but I was reading up and, and I know summer reports, every, it's all about the hype, right? And, and, and you know, just 
it seems like there's good news for every single player, but it seemed to be, you know, article after article that they're boosting up Canyon um, as, have, as doing all the right things this summer, uh, kind of transforming his body a little bit. And, you know, this is a system, whether you look at Brian Harson, whether you look at Mike Bobo, there is always, always a wide receiver that pops. And it's usually a guy on the outside, like we've seen with Preston Williams at Colorado State, with Warren Jackson. Somebody always hits. Um, so I, I lean Canyon here. Um, can Bo Nix support, you know, a, a, a guy like Canyon to becoming a, a viable fantasy option? Uh, remains to be seen at this point. But um, yeah, I, 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 I want to see confirmation that Canyon is going to be the guy coming out of that Auburn wide receiver court. Yeah, I feel Bo Nix sometimes, and this is just my personal uh, feeling on this. I feel like Bo Nix gets a bum rap, bum rap sometimes. I, I, I feel like we some people, some guys mention him as if we're talking about Sam Hartman at Wake Forest uh, with how bad of a year Sam Hartman is. I feel like Bo Nix has potential. He's shown that. I just, you wonder if the, maybe this is the system and maybe this is the year for him to put the pieces together. Uh, but I have more confidence in in that offense. But I do think some playmakers do need to emerge at receiver. So without a doubt, we'll be keeping our eyes there. Now, talk about playmakers and receivers emerging. Uh, what about questions at Rocky Top, man? Let's go up to uh, Tennessee, Mike. What, what are your questions for the Vols going into preseason camp and the new season? Quarterback. Um, I saw a tweet, and I, I don't remember it exactly, but I think they had betting odds on the um, – on the quarterback position there. And Joe Milton is the, is the odds on favorite, I believe to, to start there for Tennessee. Um, as a Michigan fan, I've seen him up close. I mean, he, he is a mountain of a man, you know, six foot five, um, can throw the ball out of the football stadium, um, you know, very mobile, but he completed 47% of his passes at high school in high school. And it wasn't any better at Michigan, right? Um, maybe you can blame the coaching staff at Michigan um, but, you know, he's never been an accurate passer um, at any point, really, in his football career. So, um, you know, I think he's a good fit, potentially, in this, in this Jeff Le or uh, not Jeff Levy, in this Josh Heupel offense, just yeah. because how often they throw it deep. Um, and that, obviously, with, with uh, Joe Milton's big arm, I think that is, could be a, a good combination there. Um, but then you got other guys like Hennon Hooker, who was our initial favorite and, and might still be the favorite. Harrison Bailey looked good in the spring game. So um, is this a position that I'm drafting this year in any formats because of, you know, Josh Heupel? No, I think it's more going to be a, a, a transition year. And we'll kind of look to, to stream a guy, uh, whoever the starter is in a, in a good week or a favorable matchup. But, you know, I'm, I am still curious as to see who comes out here. Hey, I, I mean, look, no different for me. I just think it's a very intriguing quarterback battle when you look at the skill set of Milton versus Hooker versus Bailey. I mean, really, um, you know, you've got guys on different parts of the spectrum right there. And, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we likely know the receivers or who they're going to be. We likely know who the running back one will most likely be, even though Heupel does like to distribute carries as well when he has more than, you know, when he's got a talented backfield. But Everything's going to start and end at the quarterback position. And so uh, what we can tell you through our experience with our fantasy drafts is that, um, you know, there's value for Tennessee at quarterback late. Um, you know, these guys like Hendon Hooker, they're, they're still on the board late. So you're, you're going to get them. And, and I think, Mike, based on ADP, Hooker is probably the guy that's going to go off the board a little earlier. And the way that I see it right now and the reason why I have leaned on Hendon Hooker is just I think all things considered equal, um, if if no one really distinguished them distinguishes themselves as a passer, Hooker may bring a little bit more in the run game uh, and do be able to do a little bit more with his legs. And I think for me right now that has been the early tiebreaker in spring and throughout summer. But we're going to see how things unfold in preseason camp. One state away. Let's go to Kentucky, Mike. Uh, new offense there. Uh, what are we expecting from the Wildcats? What are the questions going into the new season? If we continue to hear that Chris Rodriguez is going to get 25 touches a game, um, I, I, I do like Chris Rodriguez this year. I'm, it is, again, another team that's kind of 
difficult to project just in terms of you're bringing in an NFL style offense with, with, so we don't really have a, a, a history from a, a college standpoint of, of what this offense looks like. But I mean, if it's, if it's, if Mark Stoops has an imprint on this offense, we've seen with Benny Snell, uh, you know, in years past that you're going to get 200, 250 carries out of your running back one. So um, if we kind of get more tea leaves that, that Rodriguez uh, is going to hit that 25 touch mark, um, then, then he might jump in the rankings because we've talked about before how easy or favorable, I guess not easy, it's never easy in the SEC, but it is a favorable schedule both, you know, at the start of the season to kind of get, get in the groove, but then at, in those playoff weeks at the end of the year, they get Vanderbilt, they get Louisville, I believe, and then that typical, you know, week 11, 12 cupcake that the SEC normally plays. Um, so that'll be beneficial to all Kentucky players there. And I was reading, um, I was reading a little bit earlier, just to close on that, that uh, uh, Smoke, their backup is, is nicked up at this point. So, you know, they, they do have depth, but if, if Smoke is injured for any significant amount of time, then they could really lean on Chris Rodriguez this year. Yeah, just to shed a little light on what you're saying, you know, I, I think Kentucky's a team that, that has potential to get out to a fast start. If you if you get Rodriguez, you're going to want him early, right? They open up with ULM. They play Missouri, nothing overwhelming there. And then they get Chattanooga, right? Those are their first three games out of the gate. Then they go to South Carolina. So really four money matchups to start the year. And I'm looking at the schedule now, Mike. Then they go, then they have Florida, LSU, Georgia, and a bye week. So, you know, the, you can survive the four-week stretch right there. And then the end of the schedule is really sweet. So, the schedule really does match, uh, really set up favorably for them as long as you can get through the middle of the season. I think for me, for that reason, my biggest question is not necessarily what's going to go on at running back because I do think Rodriguez is going to get a nice heavy dose as the running back one. I really want to see how they're going to utilize Wandale Robinson, the transfer that came over from Nebraska, and his versatility that he showed when he was over with the Cornhuskers. How is that going to translate and get used in that Kentucky offense? He's a little bit of a wild card and a joker for me. I think that um, I've probably been passing on him more than I probably wish I would have up until this point, but I think he's a player that has potential to be, to actually produce more or outproduce his ADP right now. Any feel on Wandale Robinson? Yeah, I think he's uh, a shoe in to lead the team in, in targets and receptions. How many that is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, we, that quarterback's uh, competition needs to get settled. And I'm yep. kind of hoping Will Levis gets that job because I think he's the better passer of the, of the quarterbacks in that competition. But there was one, I do think Wandale is a really good fit for what this new system under Liam Cohen wants to do. If you look back during his time in Nebraska, he had a 91% uh, conversion rate on his 45 targets within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So I know this offense, if you watch kind of the St. Louis Rams, uh, where Cohen was previously, a lot of that short to intermediate routes with, with their receivers. Um, so I think that'll be a really good fit for one. Yeah. yeah. Well, not many questions at Missouri, Mike, where, where kind of Bazelak returns at quarterback. Uh, they, they do replace Larry Roundtree this year, most likely. Tyler Beatty stepping into that lead role there. You know, they got Kiki Chisholm, Tusky Dove coming back at receiver, throw into talented Mookie Cooper as well. Where are, your ta where are your questions for the Tigers going into the 21 season? Yeah, I, you know, if you asked me two months ago, I would have said, oh, it's Tyler Beatty. It's that running back position that is so – uh, highly coveted under under Drinkwitz, but um, I don't think I have any any question marks there with regards to Beatty. I think he's they want him to be that workload. He gained 12 pounds this off season, so he is uh, setting himself up to be that that Larry Roundtree type back in the backfield there. Um, so no questions for me there. Um, I want to know if if maybe Connor Bazelak is is set up here for, uh, you know, a breakout season of sorts uh, as a sophomore. Um, you know, he completed, I, mm, six, I know he completed above 60%. I wonder if that was near 70%. That number is escaping me right now. But, you know, he's very accurate, but he didn't take a lot of chances downfield. Um, I think he'll have a better wide receiver core this year with, you know, the Ohio State transfer, Mookie Cooper. He's got some, you know, taller options on the outside. So, um, you know, quarterback's been, 
um, you know, a kind of a streaming option or a decent backup option in years past under Drinkwitz. Um, maybe Bazelak can, can offer some of that this year. So as far as I'm concerned, Bazelak needs to be efficient, Mike, because what I really want to see play out here is I think, and you and I have spoken about this because Beatty was a guy that has moved up our rankings from when we initially published them in the spring, but he was ranked lower than where our projections actually spit him out at. We didn't have a lot of confidence in the projections because we were worried a little bit about his size. We were worried a little bit about the workload. Um, and then all of a sudden we hear the news that he put on weight. And I think thinking back to a lot of our drafts, I know that I have Beatty in one or two of our drafts. Maybe Beatty's a guy that's going a little bit, and I hate to say this, under the radar, but maybe his value is a little bit better than where he's actually going compared to his ADP right now. And I think he has potential to have a big season if they ride him. To, if you know 200-plus carries isn't off the table in that offense, and you're looking at a Missouri team that gets Central Michigan and Southeast Missouri in two of their first three games, Boston College, Tennessee, and North Texas after that. So really, you know, their only matchup second week of the season plays Kentucky. That might be their toughest uh, game over the first six six weeks. And so I think this is an offense that could build some confidence and get out of the gate really fast before they get into the heart of SEC play. Let's head over to, uh, to the state of Texas, Mike. Let's talk about Texas A&M. Uh, obviously we haven't had to talk about quarterback there in a couple, in, you know, in three years. Uh, but for me, um, two questions it is a double parter for me. Uh, you know, maybe I'm stealing one for you and I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go, but you know, I, I I'm predicting Haynes King to win that quarterback spot. Uh, so, but, so I think some eyeballs will definitely be there for me, but, uh, that offense is built around, in my opinion, around the run. Jimbo Fisher's always had a strong running back and there needs to be improvements along the offensive line. This preseason camp, we're not going to probably be able to see that play out until the season starts. But for me, that's where my biggest questions for the Aggies are. It's, it's replacing quarterback and the, uh, the offensive line. How about yourself? It's the offensive line. Um, you know, we're, we're, we love that backfield. Um, you know, Haynes King is getting all the uh, QB1 reps right now. So um, feel confident there. Um, some question marks at receiver, but, you know, it's a, it's a good group with Amy Smith uh, leading the way. Um, but is that offensive line going to hamper that entire offense this, this season? I just reading reports so far, you know, they had a, they, we saw the spring game wasn't good. And they're getting their butt kicks. They're getting their butts kicked already in, in camp so far this year by the defensive line. They are constantly in the backfield, the defensive line so far. So um, is that just going to, is that going to ruin Isaiah Spiller's value? Is that, you know, going to make this whole offense kind of cripple the entire offense this year? Well, keep in mind, the Aggies do open with Kent State, Colorado, and New Mexico. So the schedule is really built for them to develop some chemistry in the opening of the season going into SEC play. The defense is going to be strong. And when you look at the playoff weeks, two of the last three weeks, they play Ole Miss and Prairie View A&M. So the schedule really sets up for them to have a fast start, and it really sets up well for them during the playoff time. And so those are a couple of things to kind of keep your eyes on. Uh, you know, to think about when you're drafting a, a running back like Isaiah Spiller and, and, and have your eyes on that Texas A&M offense. Uh, Mike, let's go over to Georgia. Um, you know, not a lot of questions there at quarterback. Um, we know that more than likely it's going to be, uh, you know, Zamir White, but, you know, they're going to run out a bunch of backs in that offense. Where are your questions for the Bulldogs going into the new season? Jermaine Burton and then who? at receiver. I think I saw Kyrus Jackson was nicked up. I'm not hundred percent sure what that situation is right now. Um, and then, and then who starts opposite, opposite Burton on the outside. I'm not sure. I think it's going to be possibly a rotation, Eric Gilbert, Justin Robinson, um, AD Mitchell, the freshman. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer for you right now as to who that guy is going to be. Um, and, and we think this passing offense is going to take, you know, a step forward under, under Monken in, in year two. Um, so, you know, they averaged 34 passing attempts with JT Daniels in those last four games. So they're, you know, you would think that they're going to throw it a little bit more this year. So um, I think Burton is a surefire 50, 50 catch, possibly a thousand yard receiver this year. Who's going to join him in that, in that wide receiver room. 
Yeah, I think that's what you and I were talking about most in the spring, right? Even before Demetrius Robertson left. I mean, you've had Kiaris Jackson, you got Jermaine Burton, you had Robertson there at the time. I think the you know there were no questions about the, those guys, and and you know particularly now, even with Burton and Jackson, what we were really concerned about is who was going to kind of fill that void on the outside, right? Who were they maybe going to be able to lean on in the red zone? Maybe some go to moments in the passing game when they needed a first down who was going to be the big body target on the outside the 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 commitment of Eric Gilbert and getting him in there you would think helps fill that void I know you and I were actually uh talking about um uh, Robinson as well earlier in the spring um but you would think that one of those two guys and you know I would think landing a recruit uh at, such as Gilbert I I would think he's going to be on the field often I think the biggest question that we have is how big of a part of the passing game will he be in 2021? And I think when you're talking about receivers, that's where my question's at. My main question is how much and how big of a factor or how big of a role is Eric Gilbert going to have in this passing game, particularly in the red zone, where I think he's probably going to be the most dangerous in this offense. Two more teams to go, Mike. Let's... um. Let's let's head over to the Florida Gators, man. Um, what are we looking for out of the the Gators going into preseason camp, going into the new season, new quarterback, uh, probably a somewhat of a new offense scheme wise, um, given given the talents of Emory Jones get, uh, versus Kyle Trask last year, right? So, what are your questions for Florida for the Gators going into the new season? You want to turn? You want I'm gonna put you on the spot. Maybe we turn this one over to you. I watched those videos you did with the industry influencers, and I know you love talking about Emory Jones. So, what are your questions about Emory Jones? I would assume. And in, in so, you know, funny story, and it gives me a chance to put a lot of my Emory Jones share in context. Uh, but Emory Jones was just a guy that I know you and I had kind of spoken um, about sort of the system, right? And I think it was, you know, the, one of the first drafts we did, I was like, you know what, the, the, the quarterbacks were tapped. And I was like, I'll take Emory Jones now. Why not? If he's, if he's got potential in that system, I'll take him. And then when I started to think about it, I was like, man, I, you know, I, I like what I see with Emory Jones. I like the potential of the offense. It's going to be different. I know he's going to do a lot more on the ground than Trask did. And, and you know what's interesting, Mike, is that back in March, April, May, while we were doing all of the prepping for the preseason fantasy draft guide, I never thought that I'd be sitting down in the first week of August telling you that every draft that I participated in, I got Emory Jones. He was not like, do you remember? There was he. There was nothing that you and I had discussions where I said, dude, this is my guy this year. I've got to get him in every draft. It just played out that way. And then by the last two drafts, I was like, damn, I've got him in every draft. I may as well corner the market on Emory Jones. Um, but really, no, I do think the, the offense is going to be uh, tailored a little bit more towards his skill set. You know, the one thing that we talk about in regards to scheduling, Florida has a very kind schedule at the beginning of the year, I think, which allows them to kind of, it's going to allow them to get off to a fast start. They're going to gel. They are going to run in some troubles within the SEC, but I still think Florida is going to be one of the better teams in the conference. And, you know, I'm going to pull up the schedule real quick, Mike, just to, just to kind of say how this played in. They open with Florida Atlantic and South Florida before they get a whole, before they play Alabama, right? So, we would think maybe you're not thinking much of Alabama, but when you look after that, man, Tennessee, Kentucky, Vandy, um, you know, LSU and Georgia uh, with an off week in between that, maybe a three week stretch where we have to watch it. And then you look at playoff time, man, South Carolina, Samford, Missouri, Florida state. If Emory Jones sticks early in the year and they've got that non-conference schedule and he comes out of the gate banging, man, there's no reason why he can't finish as a, as a top, 12 top 10 12 15 fantasy quarterback to end this year yeah it's it's something that me and you constantly talk about every year in the argument of rankings versus projections when you rank a dan mullen quarterback you know especially one like emory jones the the running types that's gonna our projections were damn near top five uh when it when you kind of sorted the spreadsheets and and look at the numbers overall with quarterbacks and and, and, but there's a little bit of hesitancy, hesitancy with him as a passer. And, you know, people mentioning that Anthony Richardson might play a part in this offense this year or challenge him for the starting job. 
but you know all the quote unquote tea leaves are still pointing in Emory Jones's direction right now. If you look at Dan Mullen over the course of his career, he is he is brilliant at designing his offenses to and tailoring them to suit his quarterback's skill set. And and they're going to they're going to run Emory Jones this year. There's no doubt about that. You look at Dak Prescott's last two years combined with Nick Fitzgerald's two years as a starter, it's 181 rushing uh, attempts per season on average between those two quarterbacks. If you get that from Emory Jones this year and he starts the entirety of the season, that's potentially a top five quarterback. right? Well, think about this too. And I'll add a little bit more color to the argument of Emory Jones, right? Think about a quarterback. Think about a coach out there that just has a system tailor made for a quarterback, right? I mean, we can think of Mike Leach, right? You plug and play a quarterback, he finds his guy. And once when he's got his system in place, you know what numbers you're going to get. You're going to get 40 to 50 pass attempts a game. That quarterback's going to hit their numbers. But when you think of two coaches out there that are able to adapt what they do for the talent that they have, there's two names that really stick out at me, Dan Mullen and Lincoln Riley. They have, they have different style of quarterbacks from year to year, and they always seem to make it work. You and I spend a lot of time talking to people and answering questions and saying, sometimes you just have to trust the scheme. You have to put faith in the scheme, much like Wisconsin, right? We more, more than likely, if they find that running back one, who's not going to want that starter in the Wisconsin offense? But Dan Mullen and Lincoln Riley do a better job than almost every other coach in the country of fitting their of of coming up with a scheme to fit the talent of their roster. And when you look at floor, I mean, look, we could make the same case for Spencer Rattler right now because Spencer Rattler didn't tear up the world right now. But guess what? Spencer Rattler, uh, you and I, uh, there's a lot of other folks out there. They have him as a top three fantasy quarterback going into into this year. Right. Spencer Rattler did not have the year that Matt Corral did last year. So, you know, there could be a case to say, you know, why should we, but we trust Lincoln Riley. We trust Dan Mullen. There's questions at Florida at running back. There's questions at receiver, but we trust that he's going to have a scheme in place. And right now the most talented player he's probably got is going to be touching the ball every play. And in my opinion, right now that's Emory Jones. And so that put uh, gives you a little context of why, I didn't plan on getting on the Embry Jones bus, but I just find that the value was there early on. And I just kept riding the wave. And the more that I looked at it, the more I liked it. And I said, I'm going to trust the projections. And you're right. Emory, you know, the Florida quarterback and Emory Jones came out projected high. We were hesitant to rank him too high with where the numbers came out. But, uh, you know, much like Andy Isabella a few years ago, Mike, that you and I went back and forth. We were like, how the hell we have this guy ranked so high? You know, the projections are coming out so high. He hit those numbers. There's two guys that I looked at this year where the projections came out a lot higher than where I thought we were going to rank them. Uh, Ball State receiver Justin Hall and Emory Jones was probably another one. And even someone we talked about on the show already, Tyler Beatty. So there's a number of guys out there that projected a lot higher than where we're a little initially uh, hesitant to rank them too high. And so who, wow, man, we just spent about 10 minutes on Florida Gators and Emory Jones, man. But that, well, that kind of gives yeah. some a little, a little context of why I'm on the Emory Jones bus this year. And I never came out thinking that I was going to have that stand, but I have so many shares in them now. Uh, I love where I'm at because it's sink or swim. If Emory Jones hits, nobody else has them in any league that I'm playing in. Yeah, I think, um, you know, two months ago, our question would have been, is Emory Jones going to be the starter throughout the entire year? I think at this point, just kind of reading up, it's going to be, is Emory Jones going to stay healthy for the entire year, taking on that that rushing workload that we talked about? And then, I I mean, we spent 10 minutes talking about Emory Jones. I think that's a that's a sign of how much we care about the other pieces with Florida this year. I mean, running back's going to be a a committee in addition to Emory Jones's workload. And then I am not sure he can, uh, Emory Jones is good enough of a passer to support any receiver in that. that Well, think about this, Mike, as well. When Dan Mullen was at Mississippi state, Nick Fitzgerald, Dak Prescott, can we name any of the other running backs or receivers that were there with them? But we know the, how the hell productive they were, right? Was Kylan Hill there with Nick Fitzgerald one year, maybe? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean. Maybe. (laughs) No receivers, though. I can't name one receiver. No, No, there you go. 
So, all right, man, let's, uh, let's end up with the Crimson Tide, Alabama, the, uh, the defending national champions, Mike. Um, a lot of turnover there on offense. What are we thinking with the Crimson Tide? What are we seeing already as practices started up? So let's kind of put that together from what we were thinking, e exiting spring to where we're at right now, one week into preseason camp. I think you can look at both running back and wide receiver. Uh, my questions were more for wide receiver just, and we were talking about this pre-show right now the same starting group of receivers during the summer in their summer workouts is the same that are repping so far in the first week of camp, which makes sense. It's John Mechie, Javon Baker, and Slade Bolden right now. Um, I was under the, not the impression, but I was, I was under the belief that Jameson Williams was brought on to be that kind of field stretcher for this offense, right? And with his, with his blazing speed. And I, I thought eventually he would overtake Javon Baker for that, that secondary um, outside receiver spot across from Mechie. Early on, it's, it's, it's Jamison Williams lining up behind Mechie um, and running with the twos. Maybe that changes. You mentioned beforehand that, um, that, you know, don't, don't take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. You know, it's still the first week of camp here. Um, you know, but with this offense, you know, even with Bill O'Brien, we still expect them to be a high flying passing offense. Yeah. Just that's how Alabama has morphed over the years now. Um, that, that wide receiver too is going to be a, a viable option in, 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 in college fantasy this year. So I'll be looking to see how those wide receiver rotations um, kind of morph this year. Um, Mechie's obviously the wide receiver one there, but, but how does it, how do they look uh, beyond him? So, so same, same with you. And, and we cautioned everyone earlier in the show, don't read too much on the first few days of camp. They've got some pieces that can move around when you've got talent like Alabama does, they're going to find a way to get their most talented players on the field. No doubt about that. They have to, they start out of the gate really fast. They get Miami Mercer and at Florida, Two of the first three, Mike. Uh, one question that I'll pose to you before we get out of here, since you threw the Emory Jones question to me. Uh, we've also gotten a little bit of questions in regards to Bryce Young and why are we so high on Bryce Young going into the new season, considering that he's just, um, you know, he's just taken over the reins. He's already probably a million dollar quarterback and hasn't taken a significant sack uh, snap up there uh, in Tuscaloosa. Can you put a little context around why we're so high on Bryce Young before we get out of here? Yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, is, I, I, I don't have this in front of me, but um, I would assume over, you know, the, the last few years, he's the highest rated quarterback of, of anybody they've had back there. Um, so you would think if the, if the recruiting rankings are accurate, that he's the best that, that they've had at quarterback um, over the last few years. Seven-year average for Alabama quarterbacks. 3,200 passing yards, 29 touchdowns. The last four first year starters, that average is 3,500 and 32, 3,500 passing yards and 32 touchdowns. So if this is the most talented guy that Alabama has had, and again, it's, you know, debatable, you know, they had Tua, Mac Jones was obviously really good, but, but if he's on the same level as those guys, he's going to succeed in this offense, regardless if, you know, Bill O'Brien ends up screwing, or, you know, I don't think he'll screw it up, but, um, you know, there's obviously boatloads of talent there. History has shown Alabama quarterback is going to succeed. Well, the one thing that was really nice too, Mike, just to kind of put a bow on it was Bryce Young had a really nice spring too, right? And it's not like he's going up against, uh, you know, some prep squad defense. I mean, Alabama's got talent, whether it's on a two or three deep up and down the board. So whenever you have a good spring against the Alabama defense, um, no matter how vanilla they may be running things, it's still impressive right now. And that's still a good sign for what's to come for Bryce Young in this new season, man. Look, that's going to do it for the SEC. We've got one conference ready to go and uh, Sunbelt, we're going to do that conference. We'll be done with this series. And just like Mike is talking about already, we're getting tidbits and news from around the country that's coming in. Camps have opened the news is coming in hot and heavy. If you don't have your preseason content because you haven't had your preseason fantasy co college fantasy football draft yet, head over to the CFF site. We've got everything you need, everything you need. We're going to get started real soon with getting into that week zero content. It's, it's, it's getting here. It'll be here sooner than later, but 
That's going to do it for the SEC, uh, SEC show, the preseason preview series that we're doing that Mike and I are working on. We've got one left to do, Mike, Sunbelt Conference. So that's it for now. For Mike Bainbridge, my name is Joe DeSalvo. We'll see you guys on the final show, which is going to feature the Sunbelt Conference. See ya.